It was the bloodiest civil war in all of antiquity and a defining moment in the history of the Roman Empire. Romans fighting Romans in a battle that left 40,000 dead. Sparked by the assassination of a ruler who was worshipped like a god. Fueled by the ambitions of a handful of men whose names are still famous more than two millennia later. and fought under the watchful eye of an equally famous Egyptian queen. The Battle of Philippi would change the course of Roman history. Forty-four BC, ancient Rome is at a turning point. It's moving quickly from a republic governed by representatives of the people to a dictatorship, with ruler Julius Caesar consolidating power and governing like a king. The Roman Senate sees its power diminished. A majority of senators despise Caesar's regime and remain faithful to the republic. Two senators, Brutus and Cassius, lead a conspiracy to assassinate Julius Caesar and restore the Republic. Caesar's right-hand man, Mark Antony, learns of the plot and tries to intervene, but is blocked by the conspirators. On that day, the 15th of March, 44 BC, in the Senate portico, Brutus, Cassius and their fellow conspirators surround Caesar and brutally stab him to death. By the time Mark Antony arrives, it's too late. As the second most powerful man in Rome, Antony has good reason to fear for his life. Antony had been Caesar's protege, friend, and closest political ally. In a single day, his world and Rome's future are altered forever. The assassination causes civil unrest in a city divided between Caesar's enemies and his supporters. Caesar had been popular among the common people. Many Romans believe a god has been murdered. A bloodbath seems imminent. The news reaches Cleopatra, legendary queen of Egypt, who has been living in Rome under Caesar's protection. Cleopatra was Caesar's mistress and had borne him a son. His death puts Cleopatra and her child in danger. While grieving for Caesar, Mark Antony learns that the conspirators had no plan for governing Rome. There's a power vacuum that a shrewd politician might fill. Antony calls an emergency meeting of the Senate. He makes a stirring plea for reconciliation and lays down a warning.
e gote brutte bene novi. Nec dubito que pro virtute in qua tibi nihil sit optatius libertatem. Itta egeris und hang vindicare, nec vap illo abhorere volueris. Itta quem sentio senatu consultum fiat, ut et omnibus coniurationis principibus venia atque impunitas detur. Et omnia acta Cesaris rata sint. It's a clever strategy on Antony's part, meant to diffuse tensions over Caesar's murder and make permanent the radical changes that Caesar brought to the Republic. He appeals to the senator's pragmatism, arguing that repealing Caesar's acts would result in financial ruin and a loss of credibility for Rome's leaders. Equidem aperte loc for animum vestro appello. Nisi omnia acta Caesaris rata erunt. Omnes pleraque et magistratus perdemus. Quanam autoritate sit itta sit. De Republica. De civitate. De populo romano statuatis. Rebriores in dies convenium Caesari veterani. Ac fibus terras republice redendas esse. Cum abrogata iam sit ilius acta qui has dona verit? Fis autem vestrum pallam, is dicere audeat. Antony has the senators in the palm of his hand, except for two, Brutus and Cassius. What they will do next is anyone's guess. Many Romans credit Mark Antony for restoring peace to a divided city. Filled with confidence, Antony calls for the reading of Julius Caesar's will. Amici, in pique legere. Antony has good reason to be optimistic about the will. He had been Caesar's friend and protégé, but the will contains a surprise. Gaius Julius Caesar, sororis sua inipotem Gaium Octavium, heredem sum ex dodrante instituit. Preterea inimacera Gaium Octavium etiam in familiam nomenque adoptat. Populo autem Romano, ortos suos circa tiberim sitos publice legat. Caesar's great nephew Octavian may have inherited the ruler's estate, but Mark Antony believes that he is the rightful leader of Caesar's movement. Antony needs a chance to convince the people directly. Caesar's funeral provides the perfect opportunity to assert his power and stoke the people's passions about their murdered leader. Once again, his oratorical gifts are a potent weapon. Voci Caesar privatus mortuus esset. Magnis orationibus non mihi opus esset. Set quoniam et ille in sumo imperio perit, et ego etiam consulantum gero, Nulla zresquedicente sunt tacere de beo. Certer pater il, cam vis pontifex maximus, sacrosanctus, vir magnus, divus, tamen ab amicis, a civibus oxisus est, quam nullus hostis interficere potuerat.
kwit opus fuit, telenitate tua, o Ceza. Kwit sacro sanctitate, kwit legibus. Te crudelissime ab amicis oxissum esse. O dolorem, o cruorem a canno capillo stilantem. Ceratam antogam. Pam nulla razione vestivisse videris. Nisi ut in ea ferum reciperes. Reovem. Rome custodem. Per celestes deos. Iuro. Iusurandum do. Me cesaris mortem. Per ste culturum esse. Roused by Antony's speech, the crowd closes in on Caesar's funeral pyre. They set it on fire and throw personal belongings into the flames. Caesar is mourned as a martyred god. Antony has succeeded in rallying the people behind him. Seeing the people's wrath, Brutus and Cassius flee the city. Mark Antony is one step closer to seizing power. But Caesar's killers aren't the only ones to flee. Cleopatra, queen of Egypt, feels vulnerable in the aftermath of Caesar's death and returns to her homeland. Egypt is the most important country in the east, the supplier of grain for the entire Mediterranean. The port of Alexandria is the largest in the world. Its lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. With Caesar's death, Cleopatra has lost not only her lover, but the protector of her kingdom. She has only met Mark Antony once. The queen is unsure where she stands with the new regime in Rome. She decides to watch and wait. While Cleopatra bides her time, Caesar's heir, Octavian, arrives in Rome. Octavian is only 19 years old, but he receives a greeting fit for a king. Hecke Caius Iulius Caesar Octavianus. The young Octavian is inexperienced in politics, but he possesses natural charm and keen political instincts. Octavian sees Antony as a rival for the leadership of Rome. He uses his wealth to build political support and raise an army. Caesar's assassins have ambitions of their own. Brutus and Cassius regroup in the eastern part of the empire, Brutus taking control of Greece and Macedonia Cassius establishing a base of operations in Syria. They raise armies of tens of thousands of men to defend their cause. Once conspirators, they now see themselves as liberators who will restore the Roman Republic in the name of the people. Faced with a growing threat from the liberators, Antony and Octavian join forces. They form a triumvirate with Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, Caesar's top lieutenant. Under this, the second triumvirate to rule Rome, the three men agree to share power for five years, 
avenging Caesar's murder would be the surest way of maintaining that power. The triumvirate moves quickly and brutally. They execute political opponents and seize the assets of wealthy Romans. Panic sweeps through the aristocracy, causing many of them to flee. From now on, Antony and Octavian would be known as the Caesarians. With their military forces strengthened, the Caesarians go in search of Brutus and Cassius across the Adriatic Sea towards Philippi in Greece. Antony's legions are the first to reach the Liberator's stronghold, marching over 300 miles in 10 days. Mark Antony, Rome's greatest warrior, is ready to cross swords with the armies of Caesar's assassins on the plain of Philippi. After countless wars against foreigners, Romans will fight Romans, led by men with conflicting visions of Rome's future. Brutus and Cassius take up positions on high ground close to the town of Philippi. Brutus's camp is protected by dense forest and steep embankments, while Cassius's camp is bordered by a marsh that seems impassable. Antony sets up camp about a mile away on the desolate plain. The two liberators' camps sit on either side of the Via Ignatia, the only road that crosses the Eastern Roman Empire. Brutus and Cassius block the road with a rampart and a trench. The Liberators also have a major strategic advantage. Access to the nearby port of Neapolis. This will make it easier to resupply their troops. The Caesarians have no access to the water and no nearby towns. Antony turns to Caesar's ally, Cleopatra, for help. He asks her to send 100 warships to Neapolis with reinforcements. With the Egyptian navy's help, Antony can challenge his enemies for control of the port and open up supply lines, if they can get there in time. During the first week of October 42 BC, the Battle of Philippi begins. Romans fight Romans using primitive weapons, javelins, swords, bows and arrows. One side fights to avenge Julius Caesar and continue his movement. The other for the Republic that they believe Caesar subverted. The Liberators are counting not only on the strength of their convictions, but the strategic advantage of being there first. Cassius has built a large fortification at the edge of his camp. The nearby marshland offers additional protection. Antony knows he will have to breach Cassius's fortifications. 
In less than 10 days, he secretly builds a causeway across the marsh, which will allow his forces to go around enemy defenses. Antony is joined by his new ally, Octavian, and his army. Octavian's mission? To lead a charge on Brutus's camp, while Antony attacks Cassius's forces. But Octavian's health is suffering. He had arrived at Philippi two days earlier on a stretcher, stricken by an unknown illness. Making matters worse, Octavian's physician reminds him of a nightmare he'd had, that if he went into combat, he would be killed. A bad omen for a superstitious Roman. The forces are evenly matched. Between foot soldiers and cavalry, each side has about 100,000 men. Cassius is an experienced military strategist, but so is Antony. His troops reach Cassius's fortifications and engage the enemy in grueling hand-to-hand -hand combat. Cassius rallies his soldiers with an appeal to valor. At the same time, Brutus's forces attack Octavian's camp. Octavian is taken by surprise and goes into hiding. Brutus's troops take the camp easily and begin looting. Antony's forces press on with their assault on Cassius. Milites Romani! Propagator, ut Caesaris caidem, persequamur! Antony decides to split his cavalry into two groups. The first will cut off his enemy's infantry, the second will lead a charge on Cassius's camp. Antony's forces breach the rampart and swarm Cassius's troops. Cassius, seeing his own forces going down to defeat, assumes that Brutus has also been vanquished and probably captured. Now he does what he thinks is the only honorable thing. Mark Antony wins an astounding victory, achieving all of his goals. Draw Cassius into combat, breach his fortifications, capture the camp. Brutus is victorious too. He has taken Octavian's camp. Cassius has killed himself for nothing. Brutus was neither defeated nor captured, but his suicide deprives Brutus of a much needed ally. Some six miles away from Philippi, the battle for control of the seaport of Neapolis is underway. Ancient naval warfare is fought with a combination of ramming and boarding enemy vessels. At Neapolis, Brutus and Cassius's fleet thrashes the Caesareans. The liberators close off access to the sea for good, shattering Antony's hopes for supplies and reinforcements.
The outcome might have been different if the ships Cleopatra promised had arrived, but there was trouble at sea. Cleopatra's fleet is caught in a terrible storm on the Mediterranean. The Queen has decided that pressing on to Neapolis would be too dangerous. She wonders what Mark Antony will think when her fleet doesn't show up. Defeated at sea, but prevailing on land, the Caesareans feel confident. The marble to walk of Novi. No malus clear to be yes. Melius. In eterna gloria sit Caesar. Unus verus. We want Marcus Antonius. We want Marcus Antonius. We want Marcus Antonius. The defeat of Cassius establishes Antony as a military mastermind and heir to Caesar's legacy. Brutus must press on without Cassius, who he has relied on as a military strategist. Ultimus Romanorum fuit Cassius. Co neminem forciorem urs unquam dignere poterit. Quem tassi clamum mandum curate. Ne funeribus magnis animi militum cecidirit. Similites de brute clam accusant. Se cladem pudere itaque. Iusatua efficere minime cupiunt. Que cum hostes victores oderint. Rupsus pugnare cupiunt. Nos risoc dicide. Clarissima victoria oge pugnatum esse. Quae paene plena fuiset. Nisi nostri. Cum hostes profligare possent. Utaguiani castra festinanter di ripere maluiset. Quitame nostes, sumis in angustiis, aut diu resistere poterunt. Quo igitur patientius perseverabimus, eo maiore ri vittoria. Even without Cassius, time is on Brutus's side. His enemies' supplies are running short. Foul autumn weather is taking hold. Every day, Antony's legions take up positions at sword's length to taunt Brutus's troops. Brutus feels increasingly alone without Cassius's counsel. He delays the final battle against the Caesareans, still believing that time will work in his favor. At Antony and Octavian's camp, the situation is becoming critical. They are on the verge of famine. Morale is low, the troops are tired of tramping through the autumn mud, and in the morning they have to break off a thin layer of ice that forms on their fingers overnight. Supplies are few and far between. How much longer can they hold on? Brutus's camp is well supplied and his soldiers comfortable, but his authority is waning. His decision to delay the battle is draining morale. The troops are restless. 
the pressure from his men wears Brutus down until on October the 23rd, 42 BC, he agrees to do battle. Sicut Pompeius Magnus, non imperator, sed imperatus bellum gesturus esse videor. Quoniam ita est, in proelium rodeamus, signum Apollonis to, codutinam nos tegat. Word of the impending battle quickly reaches the Caesarean's camp. Brutus, at pugnam venit. The Caesareans have been standing in formation every day for three weeks, waiting for this moment. The Romans believe in omens, especially when heading into battle. Through omens, the gods communicate with mortals. The eagle is a symbol of Jupiter, the most powerful god. On the day of battle, two eagles fight above the two opposing camps. The soldiers watch intently to see which one wins. closest to the Caesarean side prevails. A good omen for Antony and Octavian, a bad one for Brutus. Antony calls his troops to battle with his usual flair. According to the historian Appian, he says, Milites Romani, propagator, ut Caesaris caidem, persequamur. Soldiers of Rome, the enemy is before us. Those whom we have tried to draw out from behind their fortifications. Let none of you prefer untreatable and murderous hunger to enemy ramparts and bodies, attainable through courage, the sword and despair. Our situation is so bad that nothing can be postponed until tomorrow. It is today that will be decided either complete victory or death with honor. This would be the final confrontation between the Caesareans and the Liberators. The second battle on the Grecian plain of Philippi. In keeping with Roman military protocol, one of Brutus's top officers surrenders to the enemy inviting the Caesareans to accept battle. Brutus, the reluctant general, speaks to his men. Pugna mos copiristis, a pugna me corrigistis, cumalio more vincere possim. Quae spes et mea et vuestra Wobis non de igienda est! Cum superiora! Lobis no casunt! Tuta coeterga! Tu minini quo loco ostis! Qui inter nos et fame intersit! The 
two armies are finally ready to face off. Legio Expedita! Armina! Venus! Gladios! Stengari! Antony, a master military strategist, has a plan. First, he would stretch out his right wing, forcing Brutus to do the same and weakening the center of his battle formation. Then, Antony would take advantage of the gap to send his cavalry into the heart of Brutus's camp. Finally, Antony's forces would surround Brutus's infantry using a pincer movement that would prove fatal to the enemy. Brutus makes headway into the Caesarian ranks, but his weakened centre can't hold much longer. He reminds his soldiers of the righteousness of their cause, the defence of the Republic. Aut victoria mea, Romanis libertatem reddet, aut mors, mi servitute liberavit, que terra tuta securaque sunt nisi hoc, utrum nos in libertate vituri, and Morito Rissimus. As the plain reddens with blood, the hope of victory increases the Caesarians' fervor. The hand-to-hand -hand combat is intense each side fighting with the same weapons for every inch of ground. The historian Appian tells us one side fights for survival rather than victory, the other for victory and to please a general whom they had forced to fight against his will. The carnage and the howls of the dying are atrocious. Antony's cavalry disperses Brutus's troops, preventing them from regrouping. Brutus's forces capitulate under Antony's pressure. To the Caesarians go the prerogatives of victory. For the losers, there is little mercy. Miserere nobis, Caesar! Poignam petimus, non ne romani sumus? Fili juventut am inspice! Quare egos tibus supplicibus, conquere redebeam. Aliquid tamen opportunum efficere possum. Tortibus consulemus uter integersit. <laughs> Diripite milites! Ut promisum e! Quam praeda meriti estis.
At the end of the second battle, Brutus, the losing general, flees to the surrounding hills. Antony's strategy has worked. By striking at Cassius first, he left the inexperienced Brutus ripe for defeat. Forty thousand men have died at Philippi, making it the deadliest civil war in ancient history. Armed with the same weapons, speaking the same language, Romans fought against countrymen, friends and even brothers. Like Cassius, Brutus takes his own life, preferring death as a free man to the humiliation of capture. Ancient historians say his dying words are, O oh, wretched virtue, thou were but a name, and yet I worship thee as real indeed, but now it seems thou were but fortune's slave. With Brutus, the last flames of the Roman Republic die out. His body is laid out before the victors. Cura magna funera i lifiant. Cineres matridentur. Even on the heels of a great victory, the differences between Octavian's and Antony's personal ambitions are apparent. For now, though, Caesar is avenged and the Caesarian's power secured. The 500-year-old Roman Republic is all but a memory. Peace has been restored, at least for now. The people of Rome welcome the end of hostilities. Crowned in glory, Octavian and Antony divide the empire between them. Octavian takes the west, while Antony rules the east, the richest part of the empire, with Alexandria as its capital. Cleopatra remains in Alexandria with her son, Caesarion. She worries about their safety and the future of Egypt, unsure whether the Caesarians are friends or foes, especially after she failed to provide the naval support they asked for at Neapolis. Rome sets its sights on Egypt. Mark Antony knows that the port of Alexandria controls trade in the east and could be a strategic base for expansion of the Roman Empire. Cleopatra holds the key. One of the bloodiest chapters in Roman history is over. But for how long? With two ambitious men sharing power and a smart, beautiful queen ruling a kingdom they covet, the stage is set for a final showdown. Explore the sunken ruins of a notorious town in Wicked Pirate City, brand new next Sunday at 8. Stay tuned for part two of Rome's Greatest Battles.